All right, it's now 11 o'clock, so let's get started. Uh, my name is Sam Donowski. I'm the state director of Sierra Club's Connecticut chapter. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm coming to you from Connecticut, the occupied lands of many indigenous tribes, including, but not limited to, the Nipmuc, Mohegan, Pequot, Niantic, Fogusset, and Scaticoke. On behalf of the Sierra Club, the North American Megadam Resistance Alliance, NAMRA for short, and the Indigenous leaders here today, I welcome you and thank you all for attending. I want to recognize and thank the Sierra Club staff and leaders joining in and supporting this work, including our national team and our chapters in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York, and Connecticut. We're gathered together on this day because the New England governors and Eastern Canadian premiers are scheduled to hold their annual conference where they discuss issues including international trade and energy. We are here to raise our opposition to large impoundment Canadian hydro because of the negative impacts it has on Indigenous communities and the environment. We'll start with an incredibly moving video that features the voices of Indigenous communities about the devastating impacts that Canadian hydro has on their rights lands, culture, livelihoods, health, and more. We will hear from Meg Sheehan from NAMRA, Chief Kirk Francis of the Penobscot Nation, Chair Lady Melissa Ferretti of the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe of Plymouth, Massachusetts, and John Gonzalez of the Standing Bear Network. We'll have time at the end for questions, first from the press and then from attendees. Um, let's begin with the video. A big thank you to John Gonzalez for producing this video. Through it, we can witness the terrible destruction that Canadian Hydro has on Indigenous people. And go ahead and start the video. <laughs> Each year, Northeastern governors in the United States and Eastern Canadian premiers meet at the Coalition of the Northeastern Governors Conference, or CONEG, to cooperate on economic, social, and environmental issues. These include discussions on energy policy that would tether the United States to Canadian hydroelectricity for the next 40 to 60 years, hydropower that poisons waters, destroys carbon sequestering forests and fragile ecosystems, and contributes to the cultural genocide of indigenous people. We demand a voice at Carnac. Manitoba Hydro claims they sell clean energy. As you can see this rock, this is the water level. The, that the debris that is caused by Manitoba Hydro. <laughs> I am standing on this sand, and the water levels are supposed to be where we have been. Manitoba Hydro claims they sell clean energy. We pick up debris. This is the water where our children swim, our people, where they hunt, fish, and trap. What are we going to do about this? We petitioned, actually, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers to um, to hold an environmental uh, prepare an environmental impact statement to accompany the project. Um, we denied that request um, and are currently seeking consultation uh, with the tribe under the. Uh, Army Corps uh, Indian consultation policy. They reverse our water flow, so our water flow doesn't flow naturally. <clears throat> it should be nothing. They said they were going to fluctuate the water the height of a pencil, but there's have been going up so high. They've been going as high as eight feet, sometimes twelve in some places. You know, it's really expensive to buy food from the store, so we have to go out hunt, trap, and fish for our foods. Our waters are not safe to swim in. We can't even drink it. I've seen um, my ancestors' graves washed out, which uh, we had to report. And then with, within about a couple of days, we had to do a reburial, a uh, ceremonial reburial. But this is what the Americans, the United States, feed on. Our way of life. Devastated, altered, hunting, fishing, trapping. 
a seasonal uh, migration in the spring, uh, in the fall. You can't do anymore because this thing plucked these, these turbines there are open and open any time. So we've been traveling back and forth between New York and Boston and other cities in, in between here. Uh, just delivering the message that the um, hydro energy that the people buying from uh, Canada is not really clean, uh, it's not green. It's basically creating a, a very terrible uh, human people living there in their uh, traditional lands for thousands of years completely disappeared uh, because of the flooding of the hydro dams. Well, what can the people of the United States do to help is they have to talk to people who have suffered, who have lived in that kind of life situation that's very devastating. The environment being destroyed, our food we're being destroyed, our economy being destroyed, our lives have been destroyed, our emotions, our mental, our spiritual, our mind and everything has been... It, it, it affects us in so many different ways. And I did it. it's so devastating that we are disconnected from the beautiful land that we have had in a past. As a tribal nation, it is our responsibility to protect and defend our inherent rights to self-determination. We are focused on ensuring a strong future for our tribal citizens, and that requires that we protect the land, the water, and all of our relatives, human and non-human. We call upon you, the Coalition of Northeastern Governors, to acknowledge and adhere to these inherent rights. Was John Thomas? So, um, a very powerful way to start. Um, I'd now like to turn it over to Meg Sheehan for remarks from NAMRA. Thank you, Samantha. Today, we're delivering petitions and messages from hundreds of people impacted by hydropower in Canada. We demand that government leaders on both sides of the border heed the voices of these communities and stop fraudulently greenwashing this electricity. Our message for Governor Baker of Massachusetts, immediately withdraw support for the main transmission corridor and cancel the contracts with Hydro-Quebec. Governor Mills in Maine, immediately withdraw from the backroom deal that you made with Hydro-Quebec and a van grid for the main corridor. Governor Cuomo, immediately cease secret negotiations with Blackstone Group and Hydro-Quebec to import more Canadian hydropower. Premier Legault of Quebec, we don't want your dirty hydropower. These are blood megawatts. Stop the fraudulent marketing of this electricity to the US. Premier Fury of Newfoundland and Labrador province, immediately cancel the Gull Island Mega Dam and implement all conditions of the Muskrat Falls Mega Dam permit. Our alliance will not stand by while you, governors and premiers, make secret deals with Hydro-Quebec so that big corporations can profit from our rivers and electricity stolen from Indigenous communities. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Uh, um, and now, Chief Kirk Francis of the Penobscot Nation. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chief Kirk Francis. I've been the elected chief at Penobscot Indian Nation. Um, 
here in the state of Maine for about 15 years. Um, proud members of the Wabanaki Confederacy here in Maine. And I uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to talk today on this important issue. Um, as you saw in the video, the Penobscot Nation started to become very concerned uh, with these projects as the more we're involved in them, uh, particularly around understanding and, and not being so caught up in what was going on locally, but trying to understand the A to Z impacts of, of a project like this. What happens um, at the source um, and what happens at the end result and everything in between. Um, we have requested, as the video indicated, a, an environmental impact study from the Army Corps of Engineers on the, on the project, and um, that was abruptly denied. We have uh, since um, started to demand uh, consultation uh, under the Corps' uh, Indian consultation policy and uh, awaiting to be heard on that. Um, the impacts uh, of, of projects like this are obviously not only concerning, uh, they just should not be happening um, in this day and age. And uh, just a couple of examples of, of people we've, we've talked to in uh, brothers and sisters in Canada, um, in the Innu Nation in Labrador, for example, uh, significantly impacted um, and would be impacted further in their territory by a project um, such as this. Um, there's been no permission sought, um, no consultations had, um, and all this damage done um, within their territory. Uh, it's, it's just had a huge cultural uh, impact on them and further uh, perpetrates the, the effect of just simply another territorial removal and done in a uh, much different way. Um, these are uh, subsistence and, in some cases, um, ceremonial um, uh, pieces of the territory that are being impacted. Um, you know, the Churchill Falls uh, generating station, as an example, um, before that area was flooded, it provided subsistence to those people in an area where they actually buried their dead. Um, and to hear stories of watching the erosion and um, and the bones floating away and those things are, are extremely sad and obviously, um, again, cannot happen. Uh, reservoir, reservoirs were created in their territory as well, uh, encompassing over 2,500 uh, square miles. So there are costs well beyond money to these projects and um, entire people's way of life and culture are impacted, not to mention the fish and wildlife impacts, the habitat, all of those things. And before you know it, when you're starting to talk about burial grounds and all, all of those other things, um, you, you basically um, have an entire culture, cultural identity stripped uh, from people. And as was mentioned in the video, there's some pretty serious words to call that. And, and genocide is certainly one of them. And I will just close by saying that the Penobscot Nation is really no stranger to the impacts um, when powers side with industrial interests over the interests of people. Um, we've watched as industry has polluted our waters uh, to a point where even today we're under a fish consumption rule. Uh, pregnant women, for example, are advised not to consume any fish uh, that come out of the river. And for a riverine people uh, with such a cultural tie uh, to our namesake river, um, again, this is not just about fishing. It's about protecting the cultural identity of a people, making sure that our children can grow up to be who they are, and that's Penobscot. Uh, so we stand in solidarity with all of you uh, in condemning this project. We call on the state of Maine to pull away from this project, let the people have a voice on this project, and also uh, consult with the inherent sovereign nations um, in this state, as well as in Canada, um, to not only uh, seek their input, but seek their permission within their own territory to be destroyed. And so, um, so I wanna thank you all again for being here um, and for allowing me to participate. Um, it's been an honor to do so and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Francis. Uh, next is Chair Lady Melissa Ferretti of the Herring Pond Wampanoag Tribe of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Lani Motalpen. Natasuis, Melissa Ferretti, Nutomas, Iquanamak, Wapakwit, Wampanak, Kanatai, Patuxet. What I said in my own language is good morning, 
My name is Melissa Ferretti. I am from the Herring Pond Wampanoag of Plymouth. I am the current uh, elected chairwoman of the Herring Pond tribe. And I'm here today uh, because it breaks my heart to think about and to see these videos and what's happening to the Penobscot and Innu nations as a tribe who's been dispossessed of all about seven acres of our homeland. Um, so I'm here today to speak out for these, these communities. So today, our tribal community continues to the work of our ancestors, protecting land and water for our youth and for our future generations. As I speak to you today, indigenous people and tribal communities throughout North America remain on the front line of efforts to address climate change and to oppose projects that will be destructive to the natural world, our Mother Earth. In my work as tribal chairwoman, I am inspired by the many indigenous activists, educators, and leaders who are bringing broader public attention to environmental justice issues. The homeland of tribal nations in the US are among those communities that are most likely to be targeted for projects that are disastrous for the environment and that have multiple destructive impacts on indigenous people's lives. Tar sands, pipelines, transmission corridors, waste dumping, etc. The Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe knows this because we have been at the ground zero of colonial resource extraction for over 400 years. As I know very well, indigenous people in New England are often overlooked or ignored with respect to matters of energy and resource development. Yet, at the same time, as a tribe whose ancestral homeland, along with the forest, the fish, and other wildlife in Plymouth, was used by the pilgrims to serve their interests as colonists. We know that we and our history as a tribe are directly connected to the decisions that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts makes about projects such as transmission, the, this transmission corridor proposed by Central Maine Power Company in Hydro-Quebec. We know that any environmental justice and threats to community well-being faced by the Penobscot and Innu Nation or faced by any other indigenous communities whose homelands and sacred places are ravaged by dams, flooding, transmission corridors or pipelines are environmental injustices and threats to the well-being that we may also face in the future. For our tribe and for all tribal nations, our self-determination as people depends on fulfilling our responsibility to protect our youth, elders, and all of our relatives, human and non-human. As you may know, the Herring Pond Wampanoag tribe has issued a statement of solidarity, and we are proud to stand with our brothers and sisters of the Penobscot, Innu nations, and all indigenous communities in, inserting, in asserting our right to protect ourselves and our relations against environmental destruction, including the proposed hydroelectric projects that will direct, directly impact the human rights of First Nations and tribal communities in the US and Canada. In that spirit of solidarity, we call upon you and others to acknowledge and adhere to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which was endorsed by the US Department, State Department in 2010. We as indigenous people have an inherent human right. Article 32, number 32, which states indigenous people have a right to good faith consultation and cooperation prior to the approval of any project affecting their land, territories, and other resources, particularly in connection with the development, utilization, or exploitation of mineral, water, or other resources. To us, land, water, and all of the wildlife with whom we coexist are alive and sacred. The land doesn't belong to us, we belong to it.
Thank you. Well, thank you, Chair Lady Ferretti. Um, next um, is John Gonzalez from the Standing Bear Network. Uh, thank you. Tanse Nina Kinipuit Wapiske Mikasimi Kwanapio. Many blessings. Uh, thank you uh, for sharing this space with me, allowing me to share this space with you guys uh, today. Look, our rivers are dying. Uh, our people are dying. Our moose, uh, our sturgeon, our wildlife cannot keep up with the fluctuation of these waters. Uh, we have the uh, you know highest incidences of uh, so many uh, ailments, diabetes, uh, heart disease, uh, you know, uh, teen suicide. Our communities are impoverished right now uh, as a direct result of uh, hydro, and uh, many of our, what many of our people are saying now is that hydro has really taken over uh, where the Indian Act and residential schools left off, and. Uh, I would like to, you know, capitalize uh, on what Melissa said. And uh, a nation is sovereign uh, only in so much as we can feed our own people. How will we feed our people while Hydro-Quebec and Manitoba Hydro continue to contribute to the cultural genocide of indigenous people uh, by way of uh, the United Nations uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People? We have both Canada and the United States have a truth and reconciliation obligation uh, to indigenous people uh, by way of UNDRIP. And uh, what we see right now going on is we see UNDRIP being implemented in what is essentially a termination framework. And that's what has to stop. Okay, we have to acknowledge what is going on, that, these, that the devastating effects on the land is akin to the the tar sands or the mining operations uh, that are occurring uh, all over Canada. So we're fighting these hydro dams, we're fighting these corridors, uh, we're fighting uh, you know, the Champlain uh, Hudson Power Express, which is uh, designated to provide uh, energy to those uh, people in New York, and, uh, and also the New England Clean Energy Connect. We keep using these words like, you know, like clean and green to describe uh, you know, what, what is essentially devastating to indigenous communities. This is not gonna bring you to net zero. You know, this is, uh, you know, hydro dams have some of the highest levels of CO2 and methane. You know, methane, uh, everybody knows about methane. It's the primary component of natural gas and it's up to 86 times the greenhouse effect is, uh, CO2. And this is what's being released uh, in these huge reservoirs behind these dams. This is what occurs as a result of the decomposition of organic material. And uh, a 2016 uh, um, Harvard study reported that the Romaine 4 dam will, will release some of the highest levels of methylmercury poisoning. So that's a dangerous neurotoxin. Um, I think what we need to do is we need to get away uh, from these false solutions. Hydro is not clean, hydro is not green. It is contributing uh, to the cultural genocide of indigenous people. And uh, you know, we implore uh, the coalition of Northeastern governors and our Eastern premiers, uh, as you uh, lead us into our energy future, uh, you know, to acknowledge that uh, you know these things are, are 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 devastating, and that if you are a consumer here in the United States, benefiting from hydroelectricity, every time you flick that switch, you are in fact contributing to the cultural genocide of indigenous people. Uh, so, many blessings uh, to all my relations in, in these uh, heavily impacted communities, and uh, you know once again I hope that our our, our political leaders will understand. Uh, the urgency uh, in these matters and that we will continue to live up and uh, open up means of implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I wanna, uh, that wraps up our speakers. I wanna thank all of you who spoke today for the stories you've shared and the hard work you've been doing over many years to fight 
um, Canadian Megadam Hydro, Sierra Club is proud and humbled to stand with you. We requested the opportunity to present to um, the governors and the Eastern Canadian premiers as part of their conference. Um, and we're not given that opportunity. Um, so we will, uh, this is why we're sharing this information today. Um, it needs to get out. Um, as the New England states aim to meet their climate and clean energy goals, the Sierra Club urges the governors in each state to reject Canadian mega dam hydro and inquire local clean energy instead. The main chapter is actively opposing the, pro the proposed NECC transmission line. Um, the main chapter is hosting two upcoming webinars. I will drop the link into the chat if folks want to continue this conversation and learn more. The Vermont chapter opposes the transmission corridor to be buried under Lake Champlain. In New York, the Atlantic chapter is ensuring contracting for clean renewable energy that actually delivers jobs and economic benefits to communities in New York. Um, so there's a lot happening um, in all of the states um, and that the Sierra Club is involved in. Um, so that wraps our remarks. I would like to invite um, questions, starting with the members of the press who have joined us today. And um, they, you can use the chat function or um, you can raise the hand, a hand to be called on. Um, do we have the hand raising function? I'm not sure we do. Or unmute yourself and please announce yourself and, and your question, starting with the press, please. Oh, can you hear me? Hello? Hi, I can. Is this Rick? Yeah, this is Rick. Hey, quick uh, question. Rick, could you identify yourself? And, um... uh, Rick Carlin, uh, Times Union in Albany, New York. Uh, we're interested in the uh, Hydro Express, uh, pro the Hudson Express project that's been proposed. What sort of secret negotiations are going on that you know about between the Cuomo administration and uh, Blackstone? Meg, please. Sure, I'd be happy to answer that. Well, um, the uh, New York City uh, Mayor's Office does not have a transparent process for um, procuring renewable energy. That's been a very big concern of ours, as well as many other environmental and social justice groups in New York City. Um, so that's for sure. Um, and we have therefore no way to know what kind of negotiations are going on, except that we do know that Blackstone Group, TDI, Champlain Hudson Power Express is actively pursuing this project. So there apparently must be negotiations going on behind the scenes and Governor Cuomo has not provided any transparency whatsoever with regard to this, um, TDI Blackstone went out for RFPs in August uh, using Brattle Group to try to get bidders for their projects. They will not disclose what kind of response they've gotten to that request for bids for Chippy. So there are clearly, it's only logical to conclude that there are negotiations going on, that this is behind closed doors and this is secret. It's going on in New York City. The New York City Mayor's Office has not um, provided any information whatsoever, despite our request to update us as to what's going on in New York and similarly on the state level. So that's the grounds um, for saying that there are secret negotiations. Obviously, Blackstone would not be proceeding with this RFP process with Brattle Group if they weren't negotiating with someone to buy the electricity that they intend to put on the chippy cable underneath the Hudson River and Lake Champlain to New York what, City. What is Brattle Group? Right, Brattle Group is a consultant that Blackstone hired. You can go on their website and you can see that in August, they, um, are, they put out a request for proposals to try to get bidders to buy the electricity for Chippy 
and um, what is, what is they're managing what is this Champlain Hudson oh, Power oh. Express yeah. okay. transmission yeah. corridor from Canada to Astoria, Queens. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Brattle, there's lots of lots of acronyms and lingo. Yeah, yeah. Brattle is B R A T T L E. Correct. Okay. Yes, gotcha. based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So they want to they want to find a bidder for who would purchase the power. Right. So um, Blackstone cannot start construction on the Chippy corridor until they have an 80% commitment for uh, the power okay. that's in the contra in the permit from the state. Uh -huh. So they need to get that contract in place before they can put a shovel in the ground. Right. And there's ongoing proceedings in which Blackstone is indicating as recently as two weeks ago to the state that they want to immediately start putting shovels in the ground to build this corridor. Right, okay. Did they tell the state PSC that? Yes, they did. Okay. They asked for a waiver from certain permit conditions so that they okay. could go ahead. Okay. Do you know what the permit conditions were? They related to some of the construction specs. I can send you the information if yeah, you'd if like. Yeah, you can send that. That's fine. Yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, sure. Sure. I'll give you my... What's your email? Sure. Um, you can send it to the coordinator dot namra at gmail.com. Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks, Rick. I hope and that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, other members of the press have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself or indicate in the chat. Hearing none, getting a little background noise, so someone unmuted, but I don't hear a question. Um, so um, for other attendees, um, we're happy to answer questions if you have some. And I did promise to drop in the chat the information about um, the upcoming webinars, which I will do right now. Um, so if you can post your question in the chat, I think there's so many of us, if we unmute all at the same time, it might be, um, we might lose control. <laughs> I'll start talking at once. So please, questions in the chat and we'll take them as they come. Um, so, uh, John Gonzalez, a question for you. Can you talk more about UNDRIP? What is it? And talk a little more about it. Oh, sure. Um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People provides a framework uh, of minimum standards for the survival, dignity, uh, and well-being of uh, indigenous peoples of the world, uh, as well as uh, outlining human rights and fundamental freedoms. So that was adapted, uh, you know, by the United States, Canada, New Zealand, uh, and Australia uh, very late in the game. Uh, these are all the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the real colonizing governments. Uh, but they're on board now, there are signatories, and, and now, you know, by way of UNDRIP, they really have a truth and reconciliation obligation to indigenous people. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, and Mark, could you put up um, the last slide as well? Because it's got some uh, information where email addresses are and um, a folder where a lot of background material is if folks want to access that. Um, there is a question here. Um, can someone talk about methylmercury? Who would like to do that? Sure, can, this is this is Meg. Uh, okay. Yep, yeah, John, go ahead or, or I can. No, go ahead, Meg. <laughs> So this is Meg Sheehan. I'm not a scientist, but I, I do urge everyone to take a quick look at the Harvard study from 2016 
Um, so methyl mercury is a naturally occurring um, organic material that is present in soils and in organic materials. When a reservoir is flooded or those materials are flooded, the methyl mercury is released from the materials and enters into the water column and by a bi biological process it turns into um, methyl mercury which is a lethal neurotoxin known to cause many different types of diseases and permanently debilitating conditions. Um, ever since Hydro-Quebec first flooded uh, its first reservoir 100 years ago, it has been releasing methyl mercury into the environment where it bioaccumulates in the food chain and moves up the food chain to uh, the highest uh, mammals that are relied on by indigenous people in the north. That includes uh, seals. And it's also present in fish, ducks, and birds that indigenous and remote communities in the north rely on for their food supply. Hydro-Quebec has never conducted an epi epidemiological study to know the impacts of methylmercury on uh, people in the north. And in addition, um, their response to this devastating situation is that they will post advisories on some of the lakes and reservoirs and simply urge people not to eat the food. Methylmercury can remain in the food supply for decades, some say up to 60 years. So this pre pre presents people living in the North with the option of either going hungry and not eating wild foods that they rely on, such as fish, or taking the risk of methylmercury poisoning. And this was particularly devastating to the Nunatsiat food government when um, the government of Newfoundland and Labrador had promised after hung hunger strike by indigenous youth not to flood the reservoir for Muskrat Falls Megadam in 2019 without following the scientific recommendations that organic material be cleared from the reservoir prior to flooding in order to mitigate the methylmercury that would enter the food supply of the remote indigenous communities in Canada, on, in Labrador on the coast. And over the protests and to the great distress of the new Nazi of government, which had commissioned its own methylmercury study by Harvard that showed the risk of this poisoning if the reservoir was flooded, the government of Nalcor of um, Newfoundland and Labrador and Nalcor Energy, the Crown Corporation, went ahead and flooded the reservoir. So those communities are now facing an increased risk of methylmercury on top of the existing methylmercury contamination that has been happening on their river, the Grand or Mistashipu River in Labrador since Hydro-Quebec first flooded that reservoir in the 1970s. So this has uh, been going on for 100 years. There's no way to mitigate this damage and it's an ongoing poisoning of the environment and the food supply of people in the north. Thank you, Meg. John, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, no. No, I'm good. Okay. Um, I read another question here. With the upcoming U.S. election, is the are the negative impacts of imported Canadian hydropower on the radar? Meg, you want to take that one? Sure, I'll take a stab at that. Um, well, certainly, um, you know, there are a lot of people hoping that we'll have some form of a Green New Deal here in the US. And there are lots of bills being proposed to get us to a green, you know, a, a just transition and a clean energy economy. But we are actively engaged in making sure that hydropower is not included in any of those Green New Deal type plans. Um, to jumpstart the economy. There are a lot of people who would be pushing that, pushing hydro as large dam hydro from Canada as a clean and green uh, renewable option. But as John mentioned, it's a false solution. And um, there are lots of 
politicians and the states, including the governors that we're addressing today, who themselves have been promoting hydro as clean and green and trying to greenwash their political image with Canadian hydro. Thank you. I'm trying to uh, uh, monitor the chat here and, and catch the questions. Um, can someone talk about the cost of food that is brought in? Carlton's statement about, I guess this was in the video, about their previous ability to feed all community members and now only 20% are able to do so due to lack of jobs and the high cost of brought in foods. Sure, I can talk about that. Sure, this that. is Meg. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. And Reed is on the line as well from uh, Pema Chickamack. She might be able to talk about that. But yeah, go ahead, John. Yes, of course, Rita would be uh, probably the most competent to talk about it. Uh, she, did, think, she did offer in the chat. So um, go ahead, John, and then we'll, we'll um, ask Rita to unmute. Yeah, the, the foods up there are so expensive. It, it's, it's completely out of control. And uh, I went and bought a sandwich at a convenience store. I paid ten dollars for uh, bologna and cheese between two slices of bread. You know, um, you know that the hunting, the fishing, the trapping—it's it's it's uh, it's, it, it's a part of the culture and it's a part of the way of life. And as I've said earlier, a nation really is uh, sovereign only in so much as it can feed its own people. And when you see indigenous people struggling so much. Uh, to feed themselves, uh, you know, in a climate where we're really supposed to be empowering Indigenous people, uh, their right to self-determination uh, and uh, free prior and informed consent. You know, these things are being seriously neglected, um, you know, and with that, I would defer to Rita, of course. Thanks, John. Rita, can you unmute? Would you like to share with us? your perspectives. Let's see, I might be able to unmute you. Let's see if I can. No, I'll weigh in on that while, while you're getting Rita on board. Um, there are many scientific and academic studies of uh, food insecurity in the North resulting from hydropower development. Um, I know that we have Rebecca Kingdon from Boniscaton. Is that Rita? I still see you muted, Rita. So there's lots of research out there that we could um, provide you about that. And, uh, you know, it's related to the environmental racism that um, indigenous communities suffer in Canada as a result of the colonialism and racism that has made this hydropower development possible. Thank you, Meg. Let's see if we get Rita unmuted. Rita, if you hover over um, either your own image you should, a, a blue pop-up box should come up to allow you to unmute or down in the bottom left corner, there's also a mute and unmute button. There we go. Can you hear me, Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Because I've been pushing on these buttons here, having difficulty get um, hearing and anyway, our, our cost, the cost of living in uh, in northern Manitoba is sky high. I'll just give examples of what uh, meat, like let's say six pieces of pork chops, six to eight pieces of pork chops, it's about twenty-two dollars. Uh, a jug of milk is about eight dollars. A four-liter jug of milk is eight dollars. Uh, an apple juice uh, two liter jug is thirteen dollars. So those are only examples of uh, what we uh, how 
how uh, the cost of food is very high here in our community in uh, Pimichikamak, which is across Lake Manitoba on the map. And um, our hydro rates are sky high. In summertime, $200 a month, approximately $200 a month, the highest. And in the winter time, it's uh, it's a uh, thousand dollars plus a month in in most cases. So when when we talk about pay, paying the price of hydroelectric dams, we are the people who are who are paying the price of everything, including the our uh, food web, the loss of our people while they're. Uh, hunting, trapping, and fishing. So when you talk about, when we talk about cost, everything is a cost. All aspects of life are cost. Our mentality, our mentality, our spiritual, our spiritual connection to the land is lost because it's lost because it was, it, it is never, ever, ever clean. And not just by looking at it, it makes us, uh, you know, wonder why is it happening to us? And we know why. Because the corporations all across Canada do not care. They would rather make money out of this land. And, and the other thing is, you know, those corporations, the governments, even the governments in the United States, are affecting taking their children into an environment that will not be acceptable in the future and that their children as well will be suffering. So when talking about the cost and the price of these, uh, these developments, it's the lives of the people that are being affected. Even worse here, in Canada, because I've uh, I've provided a picture of how many hydro dams are across Canada, and I was hoping to bring that on, but I can't do it. I can't do it from here. Like you know, these corridors too leading into the United States, the people will be affected even more so than right now. So the cost, the price of everything, we, we pay for it. And it hurts. I'm telling you, it hurts. Not only the emotions, but the environment as a whole in Canada and in the United States. Okay, done. Thank you, Rita. Um, Let's see. I was just going to read a question and it just got answered in the chat, but it, it might be a good place as questions are wrapping up to conclude, which is for folks on this call that want to um, join the opposition. Um, this question is uh, kind of looking for specifics, but maybe you all can speak both generally and specifically. And the question is, um, if I, and this is someone from Maine, if I were able to write one letter to the press or state officials, where would the best place person be to send my letter and what would be the three most important points to make at this time? And so that's pretty specific, but maybe you can talk generally about advocacy and how people can be involved. Meg, I will point that to you. Oh, thanks. Sure. Um, Yes, we need your help. We need more folks to join our effort. You can get in touch with us, emailing us at uh, coordinator.namra at gmail. Go on our Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. Um, and yes, writing to your governors in Maine and Massachusetts to let them know that this is a false solution that the regulatory systems in all of the New England states do not count the carbon emissions from Hydro Quebec's electricity, which according to current science is on par with fossil fuels. 
this is not a solution to the climate crisis. It's a false solution. And Hydro-Quebec is part of the problem and helped create the climate crisis. They are fraudulently greenwashing this electricity from an environmental perspective. Our rivers sequester carbon and destroying more rivers and calling it green is again a false solution. So greenwashing is one point. The impacts at the other end of the extension cord and Quebec and Labrador and Manitoba, thousands of miles away or over a thousand miles away on frontline communities that in Canada, in Canada, which is one of the world's most water rich countries on the planet, there are people like Rita and her community and people in Quebec and in the other provinces who do not have clean drinking water because of the degradation caused by the alteration of these river systems. So this is impoverishing indigenous and frontline communities and putting the externalities and the cost of this electricity on the backs of frontline people. This would never be acceptable in the US. It violates every principle of climate justice. And the third point would be that this is economically nonsense. It does not make sense for taxpayers and ratepayers in the US to pay to subsidize these transmission corridors, $3 billion for the New York transmission corridor, $1 billion for the Vermont and Maine corridors. This money could easily be spent in the US on local renewable energy generating sources and local jobs. Uh, thanks so much, Meg. Um, and I'm just gonna drop in the chat again. Um, you know, depending on what's, if you're in the states, what state you're in, um, as Meg said, uh, the Sierra Club chapters also, you know, ha are working on this issue and have um, social media and such. And again, we have two, the main chapter is hosting two upcoming webinars to dive uh, deeper into some of these issues and they'd be delighted for folks to join them there. Um, with that, I think we've moved our way through our questions um, I want to, uh, again, give a, a huge thanks um, to the speakers here today. Um, this has been incredibly moving. Um, I'm very humbled to be here with you um, and to be opposing um, large and Poutman Canadian Hydro with you. Um, again, here, uh, if you want to um, in addition to attending more webinars, um, uh, access some of the background information. It's in the Google Drive, um, and you can reach, um, you can uh, go to our web pages, uh, Sierra Club and NAMRA, for more information. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.